Welcome everyone. My name is Hans Hutchison. I am a coach and learning specialist in the Transferable Skills Faculty of Canada School of Public Service. I will be your session moderator this afternoon. Thank you for being with us. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which many of us are viewing this event is unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people. I recognize that some of our participants are, join, are joining from other parts of the country, and you may be on a different Indigenous territory. I encourage you to take a moment to think about the territory that you occupy. Thank you. I would like to share some administrative details to support your experience during this event. To optimize your viewing experience, we recommend you disconnect from your VPN and use a personal device to watch the session when possible. Please note that we have simultaneous translation or interpretation and cart services available to you for this event. Please refer to the reminder email you receive from the school on how to access these features. Throughout the event, we will be using a dynamic tool used called WooClap for participation and getting your questions. Please feel free to use your, your WooClap and you'll receive more instructions as we are moving into the presentation. You may want to have another screen or device handy so you can use your WooClap. We will offer you the access code shortly, don't worry. Please feel free to use the official language of your choice, specifically when asking your questions or interacting with us. The event is part of the leadership series, which features learning events for leaders at all levels across the public service of Canada. It is also part of the coaching summit, our coaching summit 2021. Now in today's session, we will tap into concrete evidence-based models of emotional intelligence competency levels and explains how coaching can support you and your team in developing those competencies or these competencies, sorry. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce you to David Corey, President and Founder of the Emotional Intelligence Training Company and Certified Master Trainer in Emotional Intelligence, a, a well-known topic in the public service, specifically in the Coaching Summit. So David has worked with leaders in progressive public and private sector organizations, post-secondary institutions, and governments around the world. And I must say that I've met David a long time ago at the Canada School of Public Service. Well, you offered us an amazing training on emotional intelligence. So it's my pleasure to welcome you, David, and back to you, David. <laughs> Thank you so much, Franz. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with you today and to dive into this fascinating topic of emotional intelligence. When I first heard that as the title of a breakout session at a conference, I had to sign up for that. I had to go and hear what being intelligent about emotions might be all about. Uh, and that completely changed my career. I was teaching leadership courses. And when I heard about what emotional intelligence was, I thought, wow, uh, what it seemed to me was a like a set of foundational skills upon which everything else is built for us human beings. And uh, the more I thought about it, the more I got into it, and the more I researched it, the more I wanted to make sure that everybody knew about emotional intelligence and emotional intelligence skills. So we're here in part because we human beings are evolving. We're evolving away from uh, a, uh, a more hierarchical kind of arrangement where you may have experienced in your career more, uh, more of an autocratic or authoritarian leadership style where people told you what to do. Uh, and they, you need to tell people what to do in an emergency situation or maybe on the battlefield, but not in everyday interactions. Uh, we human beings don't really like to be told what to do. Uh, it's called the terrible twos for a reason. That's the age that we learn that we don't like to be told what to do. Uh, and so we would much rather be consulted. We would much rather be engaged in conversation and dialogue. And in order to switch from a hierarchical leadership uh, 
arrangement to a more collaborative par or participative uh, leadership arrangement, that requires different skills of all of us. And so we're going to look at what those skills are today and understand more about what we mean when we talk about being intelligent about emotions. Uh, so as, uh, uh, as France mentioned, I've got this cool new tool uh, called WooClap and uh, well, new to me, it may not be new to you, but, uh, but it's new to me. Uh, and so, so France is going to remind you of the instructions for using WooClap. We're going to get you set up on it. And then I'm going to introduce you to an exercise which really makes this concept of emotional intelligence come alive. So I'm going to turn it over to you now, France, to, uh, to remind people of the instructions for how to get set up using WooClap. Yes, so uh, I think we have a slide on that. So I don't know if we can switch oh, exactly. So you see on the screen, there's there's either two ways to do this. You either take a picture with your phone of that um, square, <laughs> and it will lead you directly to the the questions and even more the presentation of of uh, of David's. Um, and so you don't need to have a, a code specifically if you're using this image. It will bring you directly there. If you decide, although, to use um, your computer, you need to type in the information that is right beside the number one, connect to, and that's the link, wooclap.com slash, and then you have the word intelligence and the number 21, and this will lead you directly to our activities and even a section for asking your questions because, yes, there will be a segment after David's presentation where you'll be asked to ask questions. Great. Thank Thanks, Franz. Uh, okay, so, so shall we give this a try? Uh, hopefully, everybody's had a chance to, to take a picture of the QR code and, and get set up. And so, so what we're going to do is we're going to create a word cloud together. Uh, and I don't I don't know how many people are on the call, but you know we had a there was a huge response to to signing up for and registering for this session. So I'm really hoping that we get a good group of people, uh, and um, we're gonna we're gonna talk about the qualities of the best leader you ever had in your career. I want you to go back, or or maybe you've got that best leader right now, but just think about what that best leader is like. And I want you to type in some words or phrases that really describe the qualities of that best leader, uh, and. I I see you're doing it now. That's awesome. That's fantastic. This is as cool as it looked. Uh, I, I've not used it before, so I was so so uh, happy and uh, in, encouraged that um, that the that the Canada School uh, was uh, was able to introduce me to this tool. And uh, I think okay, David so, will need yeah. a bit of time because there's so many participants. Like you said, there was more than four thousand people registered for wow. your event, so it might just bring a lot of activity in that Woo Club. So give it a chance rewards to just pop in and at one point it will probably settle in and we'll be able to read what's happening. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm, I'm just going to read some of the words because uh, I just love what's happening here. So of course, so we've got empathy, we've got trust, uh, and we've got compassionate, and we've got integrity, and we've got uh, inspiration and transparency and resourceful uh, and listening skills and respect. Uh, and uh, and humility, uh, and and this is fantastic. And and why do we ask about leaders? Is it always a leadership course? Uh, is it always about developing leadership? Uh, and we kind of think that it is, but may, it, that may be different than than what uh, your traditional idea or notion of leadership is. We we believe that everybody believe, uh, everybody leads their own life first and foremost. So so we are all leaders of our own lives. And as you know, some people lead their lives really well and some people struggle to lead the kind of life that they want to lead and so this is really what we're talking about and so uh, why do we ask people about the best leaders they ever had or um, and and the reason is that everybody's had a leader everybody that's been in a workplace has had a leader or a significant uh, person in their life who has influenced them uh, and this is why we do this to really have you know that you've all experienced emotional intelligence, sometimes referred to as EQ, although EQ, emotional quotient, is really a measure of emotional intelligence. We sometimes use those terms interchangeably. So, okay, so um, are, are we, uh, we must be close to being done. This, no, it uh, keeps, this it exercise. keeps it just, growing. It keeps it morphing and growing <laughs> and changing, which is so cool. And uh, we're going to have some way of capturing this, correct? We'll, we'll have, we'll be able to 
to take a closer yes. look at this at, at some later. Approachable, led by example. Uh, this is just so fantastic. I, I just love this. Uh, and then, of course, what you can think about is you can think about the impact on you. Uh, when we when we did our workshops live and in person pre-COVID, we would get people in a room, put flip charts up around the wall, get them working in small groups and, and getting them asking uh, and, and then talking about what the, what was the impact on you of these things. So what was the impact on someone who, uh, what is the impact on you as an employee of your leader being approachable? Uh, well, it feels like uh, you you feel supported, right? You feel like you can go and get what you need uh, and uh, and you feel supported in your work. Or what was the impact of someone who was a good listener? Uh, it was like you mattered. You had value to that person and they valued you. Uh, and empathy, paying attention to what's going on for you as a human being uh, and and knowing that you could be stressed or or you could be um, uh, you could be concerned about something and, and them being there for you in a more human kind of way. And many of the words that you use to describe these best leaders you ever had are, are really the kinds of things that we admire in people, the kind of thing, kind of things that we aspire to do, uh, and the, the kind of things that we aspire to be. But the, the difficult question becomes, how do we actually get there? Now, if we did the, if we looked at the worst leaders you ever had, can we do that? Can we take a look at the, uh, can we do the same, the same word cloud activity for the worst leaders that people ever had? Um, th these, these are the things that, and I want you to think about your actual experience now. So, so, um, and, pr and please don't type in any names. We don't want to, you know, we don't want to, you know, embarrass the, the guilty. Uh, in, in any case, oh yeah, you, you, you know it, you know it. There's bad listener, egotistical, arrogant, dismissive, uh, ego, uh, absolutely selfish, uh, all, all these things, micromanagement. You know, micromanagement is one of the, the top errors that, that leaders make around the world. I think they think they're doing, you, doing us a favor, right? Uh, sort of hanging over our shoulder and, and watching everything we do, but, but they really don't realize the impact on us is, is to really shut down our, our creativity and cause us to be more, more worried and concerned about the work we do, et cetera. Um, yeah, so micromanaging appears more than once, egocentric, uh, egotistical, close-minded, um, bullying. Now, bullying is a is a pretty extreme uh, kind of thing, and and of course, uh, it, it is kind of in a class uh, all all on its own, um, uh, and uh, aggressive uses people authoritarian. Yeah, authoritarian when really we're moving away from authoritarian everywhere, uh, and. Um, snob <laughs> that's a good one uh, uh, uh untrustful uh close-minded uh coward yeah this this you you absolutely get the, the get the idea of the exercise uh and it's fantastic uh to um uh to just get it out there and, and see that 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 you're not the only one who's who's had these kinds of people inflexible absent people pleaser um, a narcissist, uh, absolutely. These are these are all uh, kind of the the kinds of words that people use to describe the worst leader they ever had. So it's really interesting to think how did these people get to uh, get to to be the way that they are. Uh, and of course, uh, when we think about our socialization, we think about what we learn, what we systematically learn, what you systematically learned were your technical skills, what you systematically learned uh, in our public school systems was mostly reading, writing and arithmetic. Uh, there was not, uh, I would guess, a class uh, for you in the primary grades, which was all about how to understand your own emotions. My guess is that that probably did not uh, happen. David? Yes, I'm, I just must stop you because if some people don't see the screen, they probably need to just refresh the uh, okay. the screen. So if they don't see what we see now or what we're talking about, just refresh your screen, please. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Franz. Uh, so, so um, yeah, so so we, we do this exercise to let you know once again that you have experienced uh, healthy emotional intelligence, people who are 
uh, using their emotions in an intelligent way and the emotions of others, uh, or people who don't, who don't realize the importance of emotions, don't understand their impact on others, uh, don't understand their own emotions. And so they, uh, they, they come across uh, as not being uh, guided by uh, by their own emotions and what it, and and what their what their values might be, uh, so okay so so um, uh, this is this is fantastic and it's it's still going uh, actually, uh, but we we should wrap it up in the interest of time and uh, and move on and and talk about okay so so what was that all about well when we do this exercise uh, once again if we you know possibly post COVID we'll be in classrooms again and we'll have pieces of flip chart paper up around the room and we'll, we'll, we'll be creating these kinds of, of grids. But when we create them, we look at the quality and then we look immediately at the impact. And you can imagine what those lists look like now that you've seen all those words used and, and the, the things that you know about some of the best leaders and worst leaders that you ever had. The best leaders uh, who demonstrate those wonderful things that you wrote into the word cloud, uh, the impact on you is better work ultimately. Uh, and yes, you felt valued. You felt like the, your leader maybe treated you as a human being. Uh, you felt like they included you. They valued you. They challenged you. They believed in you maybe more than you believed in yourself at times. So many of these kinds of things. And of course, the impact is growth and development and, and higher discretionary effort and better work product and more productivity, higher morale, higher engagement, higher retention. These are the leaders you want to stay with and work for for your for the rest of your career and then that you look at the worst leaders and you look at the havoc that they wreak on workplaces they drive morale down they drive disengagement uh, they cause people to feel devalued to feel disorganized to feel uh, uh, to, to, to feel directionless to feel chaotic at times and imagine the work product is driven down and people feel like quitting and leaving uh, and there's limited choices and so uh, so so you you start coming in later and leaving early and and doing all kinds of things to try to take back your power because you feel powerless uh, and when we think about how this is or why this is uh, we think about a very simple uh, idea uh, that you all know about, and that is how people get promoted into positions of management where they have uh, the accountability and the, the kind of the power and authority over the work that you do, and it's by mostly by technical skills. Uh, it could there there could be um, uh, it could be that uh, that they've been promoted by virtue of their seniority. Uh, that happens. Uh, and it could also be that they are, are promoted into a position of management by virtue of their relationship with a decision maker. Uh, and in the case of family relations, that's nepotism, of course, as you all know. So, 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 okay. So the fact that you had one of these best leaders, how did they get to be a best leader? Well, what we know is that they probably didn't take a course on how to be supportive and honest and have integrity uh, and, uh, and, and all these things that you wrote into the word cloud, where did they learn them? Uh, and uh, of course, they probably learned them because they had significant others in their life when they were growing up that role modeled and demonstrated these kinds of ways of being in the world. Uh, and what about the what about the worst leaders? Why do the worst leaders uh, do such horrible things? Uh, are they not aware that they're, uh, imagine this, imagine someone on their way to work in the morning thinking, how can I drive productivity down today? How can I cause people to feel devalued? How can I cause people to feel terrible about themselves? How can I cause people to be looking uh, online for another job when they're supposed to be working? I don't think anybody thinks like that. It's not, it's not in their best interests. So what I think is that people get promoted once again based on their technical skills and then they're in survival mode. They've never, they may have never supervised people before or been accountable for the performance of others before. Uh, and so what they do is they do maybe what was done to them and that is uh, they, they may be forceful or aggressive about demanding a high level of work. Um, uh, they, they may be autocratic and authoritarian, and they may not think to be transparent or include you in decisions, etc. And so they drive behavior, they drive work performance down without, the, without that realization. They cause people to quit and leave 
without that realization of their impact on others. So, okay, so what are we going to do about this? Uh, how are we going to actually, um, uh, you know, get involved in changing this, uh, this horrible situation, which affects organizations globally? Uh, where, where's the intervention? Uh, and part of it comes with the understanding of the image on the next slide. So if we look at the next slide, what we see there uh, is that uh, is this uh, attempt at trying to understand what these complex, wonderful brains of ours actually do. Uh, what we know after three decades of, uh, of, uh, of the use of the functional magnetic resonance imaging uh, process of looking at brains and understanding brains uh, is we know so much more now about how they actually operate. Uh, and we know that, uh, that there's the, the part of the brain that is uh, responsible for intelligence. That's the, the part of the brain that, that is, uh, is responsible for applying logic and reason. And then we know that there's a part of the brain that is responsible for emotion. And those two parts of the brain always work together. So our brains are constantly scanning, constantly taking in perceptions of our environment, of, of what's going on around us, and giving us data. So it's whether you understand that data, whether you are able to process that data uh, and know how that data can inform you and help you to make better decisions, to, uh, to uh, see yourself in a positive light, to, uh, to connect well with others, to communicate clearly and directly. Um, uh, it, whether, whether that data, uh, whether you have the skills to be able to use that data in that way is another question. And we don't systematically teach that in our schools, but my prediction is that in the future we will. In fact, right now, the busiest group of people studying this concept is the Yale Center for the Study of Emotional Intelligence, where 47 PhDs at last count are all working on primary education, on educating um, uh, people in the primary, uh, the smallest people in our societies, uh, how to deal with their emotions, how to understand their emotions, how to recognize emotions, understand what they're connected to, and what about their environment is causing that re emotional response in them. What are emotions? Emotions are simply biochemical reactions in response to stimuli. Uh, and, uh, and of course, they, uh, those biochemical reactions cause sensations in us. And we refer to those sensations as feelings. It's a little bit about the difference between the word emotions, which is about the concept, uh, and we use that, the, the word emotion conceptually, uh, and the word feeling, which is about the sensation. What does that actually feel like? Uh, and of course, there are utilitarian purposes for feelings and emotions. These emotions kept us alive when we were primitive human beings. Fear caused us to, to you know, not step over that cliff uh, or, or confront that beast uh, or, or whatever we, we were uh, doing back in, in our primitive times. But really, um, uh, my, one of my missions in life is to move away from the idea of emotional intelligence as, as a thing to emotional intelligence as the thing. Now, that's kind of a provocative statement. How can I possibly say that emotional intelligence is it? Well, I believe that uh, emotional intelligence is life. Uh, I, believe that, I believe that emotions are life. Uh, I believe that we human beings swim in a sea of emotions, whether we are aware of it, whether we acknowledge it or not. Uh, and I believe that a session like this is a little bit like fish learning about water. Uh, that this happens without our uh, conscious attention, uh, th these emotional responses that we have to, to, uh, to life. Uh, and if, if we are unskilled, uh, we end up doing things that signal a lack of emotional intelligence. And you're all familiar with these too. Um, I've, I've done, I've created these situations myself, but symptoms of a lack of emotional intelligence skills are mistrust, misunderstanding, uh, dysfunctional relationships, uh, unclear communication, lack of communication that, you know, when you really want something from your friend, but do you, and you, you hope they get all the clues and all the hints that you keep dropping, but uh, they don't seem to get it. Um, that's a lack of emotional intelligence, the lack of understanding that you need to come out and say what it is that you need and want. Uh, and, and we do that all the time. At the extreme ends of a lack of emotional intelligence, it, and it absolutely breaks my heart, 
is what's been happening in the Middle East um, uh, uh, just just up until this this most recent ceasefire. Uh, that that's that's a lack of ability to be able to have dialogue to uh, to to have forgiveness. Uh, there there was uh, someone who was who was saying the that the Middle East needs a Nelson Mandela, uh, and uh, one of the the most incredible things Nelson Mandela did was was to forgive. Uh, and uh, so you know we, we need to get to that place uh, it, with respect to our emotional intelligence skills because violence is uh, probably the extreme uh, uh, in terms of evidence of lack of emotional intelligence skills. We have no other way to relate with each other but to use violence. That that's that's a pretty low, uh, pretty low bar. Okay, so so emotion. Uh, uh, there is there is you know you've probably heard there's multiple intelligences and maybe there are but but from my 23 years of experience of working with leaders in organizations all over the world, I counted it up the other day. 18 government departments that we've worked with uh, over the years, uh, and. Um, uh, my my conclusion is uh, that that there's one intelligence and it happens to be emotional. Uh, Jill Bolte Taylor said this beautifully in her really dramatic TED talk, where where she, as a brain anatomist, talks about her experience of having a stroke. Uh, she knows she knew exactly which parts of her brain were shutting down and described what that experience was like. And she said, based on all the neuroscience data that we have now, um, we we've changed our minds in terms of what we think about us human beings. She said, we used to think before fMRI that we were thinking creatures who felt. Now we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are feeling creatures who think. So just she was talking about the importance of, of uh, that emotional part of our brain, how critical and important it is, and how we've kind of learned in our societies and through our socialization to disregard the data that comes from our emotions. But just imagine how, what a, what, how much better a world it would be to have more of those best leaders. You all know what makes those best leaders. How do we train them? How do we develop them? How do we help them to be those best leaders? And that's where our next slide comes in. Uh, so, so we need a model. Uh, we need a model of what do we do to be emotionally intelligent. So, if we look at the next slide, you you see a wheel model uh, or a or a circle. Uh, and uh, if we could have the next slide, please. Um, we will we'll see that at the center of the model is the concept of emotional intelligence, which really is the acknowledgement that these wonderful brains of ours process emotions and emotional information in addition to all the other things that they do. By the way, uh, whenever I mention this, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of all those incredibly smart people who are working in the field of artificial intelligence. A big thing in artificial intelligence research right now is, uh, is to develop a computer that can have an emotional response. Uh, and they can't do it. They can't do it because they don't have the computing power, which is probably found, the answer is probably found in quantum computing. Uh, however, um, what they can do uh, and what artificial intelligence is, is working on uh, right now uh, is amazing and fascinating, and uh, and and uh, you know this this idea of artificial emotional intelligence is kind of like the holy grail. People are rallying around in companies uh, um, in in um, uh, in the Northeast, in in uh, in New England, uh, and in Silicon Valley as well. Uh, so, um, so, so back to this model. Uh, all right, so at the center of the model, we've got this concept or this idea that it's critical and important to combine emotions and intelligence into being intelligent in the world. Um, by the way, David Wexler de defined intelligence in 1940 as the ability, the capacity for purposive behavior. So just think about that for a moment, the capacity for purposive behavior. So basically acting on purpose uh, and, uh, and really uh, the other thing he said that you cannot disregard uh, the ability of the brain to process emotions in that. Uh, so he was paving the way, opening the door uh, for this concept of emotional intelligence, which as some of you may know, um, there are many theories, there are many approaches, many definitions of emotional intelligence throughout the entire 20th century, starting in the 20s, um, and probably earlier than that, but in the, in the 20s, I think it was Edward Thorndike, a psychologist who, who coined the term 
termed social intelligence. So that was his kind of, uh, you know, gift to the, the psychological world. And, and people have been working on this concept ever since that time. Uh, and then Daniel Goleman made the concept famous in his book in 1995. Um, uh, and, uh, and that's been translated into many languages and gone around the world. And then people are been, have been looking for a great model of what to do to be emotionally intelligent. And that was created by Reuven Bar Own in, in the early 1980s. Uh, his um, uh, model is the basis for an assessment tool called the Emotional Quotient Inventory, which was first published in 1997. Uh, and that's when I met the, pu the publisher of the tool uh, and we've partnered and they, they create these wonderful tools uh, and, uh, and we've been providing the services uh, in, uh, to organizations to help people develop their EQ uh, since, the, since 1998. So, so we've got this wonderful model uh, and in it, you can see the five categories and the five categories are, how do you perceive yourself? Um, how do you express yourself? How do you connect interpersonally with others? How do you combine emotions and logic? The in decision making, uh, and how do you manage stress? Because stress is so incredible, incredibly important uh, and impactful, uh, and uh, affects workplaces all over the world. We need to develop our skills to to uh, manage stress. So let's take a bit of a deeper dive uh, into each of these areas and look at what we really mean by this. So if we go to the next slide, uh, you'll see this uh, this little guy. Uh, and, and I like this little guy because um, it, it's, it's, it's interesting to imagine uh, what you think that, uh, that his parents, but by the way, I, I, I've com I completely forgot to, to tell you that if you have questions, and I hope you do, uh, that, you, um, that you send those in uh, and uh, you can do that through the, through the WooClap uh, app. Is that, is that correct? Yes, Fons? yes. And uh, just don't forget the code. It's intelligence 21. Or you can still take that picture if we can see it on the screen. Great. I'm um, not sure if it's on available on the screen. Not, right now, there's a question arriving, but uh, not there yet. David. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, I'll, let's, yeah. let's just go back to the image again. So people, if they lost the link, I'd like to oh, okay. have maybe just the WooClap. Right. <laughs> I'm work, making our group and uh, a teamwork. <laughs> There's uh, that beautiful QR code that we need on the screen. Hopefully we can see it. Yay, there we go. Um, Excellent. We'll have it on the screen. Just give us a few seconds, David. Um, here you go. So if you want to ask your questions to David, take a picture of that QR code with your phone or connect to the wooclap.com slash and the code is intelligence21. Thank you, David. Excellent. Thank you. You know, we were just zipping through and uh, zipping past that word cloud. And at the center of the worst leader word cloud, I saw the word selfish. Uh, and wow, does that ever encapsulate a lot, right? When, when people are in it for themselves, you know it. Uh, and uh, uh, and, and it, it speaks a bit about uh, the interesting balance that we've got here in the model, which is, which is self and others. Uh, and so, so we're all trying to strike the optimal balance between self uh, and our, our needs and our desires and our wants and our dreams uh, and others uh, and their wants, needs, desires, dreams. Uh, and how do we make that, how do we get the right balance for us? And, and of course, that, that is part of being intelligent about emotions. And and one aspect of the model is self-perception. So, so I think about this little guy, and he reminds me that that we all, um, well, I mean, certainly not all of us, but just imagine this little guy. Let's take him, uh, and imagine what his parents say to him. His parents might say, "You are awesome. You can do anything you want. Uh, you can, um, you know, you you, um, uh, you can be anything you want. You can you can do anything. The world is your oyster." Kind of idea, right? For this little guy, uh, and um, and so he gets that in all of his early years prior to going out into the world, and maybe he goes to daycare, or maybe he goes to kindergarten, or something like that, where there are other kids, and he walks in, and he's looking like this, dressed like this. Uh, and other kids are mean. And other kids might say something to him like, dude, 
why do you have that shirt done up all the way to the top? Like, we don't dress like that. Like, open up that collar. And why do you have those long sleeves anyway? You should be wearing t-shirts like we have. And why is your hair so short? And what's with the goofy grin? And, uh, and, and, and kids, are, kids say what they think and there's no filter and uh, they can be mean. So, so he goes home at the end of the day and he's got this, this different set of messages about who he is in the world and what, uh, and what his value is. Uh, now he's got to try to make sense of that. So he's trying to make sense between, um, uh, between the, what his peers are telling him and peers are pretty important in our world uh, and what his parents say to him. Uh, and he's got to uh, somehow decide which of those messages he's going to accept and which ones he's going to allow to inform his self-perception and which ones he's not. Uh, and that is a tall order uh, in the absence of assistance in processing that information. Uh, and just imagine what we could do uh, and, and how we could, could impact that. I'm not an early childhood educator. I mean, that, that's not my field. Uh, uh, and, and I know that it's part of what early educators try to do to help children with their growing self-perception. Uh, and and uh, so so we work with adults and uh, and a lot of what we do is remedial. So so how do you help someone who doesn't have a very healthy self perception? Well, what you do is uh, is you look at the at the beliefs that people have about themselves, uh, and you identify those beliefs, and you try to determine where did those beliefs come from. Uh, and um, and what is the what is the current evidence and what is a better belief what is a belief that could actually serve you better uh, at this time uh, and you know people ask me all the time what is the best way to improve your emotional intelligence skills and the answer is coaching uh, and so you know it's no accident that uh, uh, that I was invited this this week on uh, during International Coaching Week to talk about emotional intelligence because um, because coaching is uh, uh, is the answer. So having you know a uh, a regular um, uh, you know meeting with someone uh, that, with whom you are going to talk about some of these issues and some of these challenges uh, is critical and important in terms of, of changing some of those beliefs about yourself to adopting more uh, beliefs that serve you better in the world. Uh, and how, how do we ultimately come to accept ourselves? And, and, you know, I, I, I see this, this idea uh, and think of Brene Brown and the wonderful work that she's done in the world. Uh, and she, uh, she has written that wonderful book, The Gift of Imperfection. Perfection. So, wow, the gift of imperfection uh, really—it's a—it's a—it really grabs you. It's like you mean there are gifts in my imperfections, uh, and the when we when we come to accept that perfection is not a reasonable goal for us human beings. And to understand that there are things that we're good at and there are things that we're not good at. Um, uh, it's, it's like the day my, my spouse came to me and said, you, you are a pretty good trainer, but you're a terrible accountant. And if you don't hire an accountant, uh, this business is not going to succeed. Uh, when I had to acknowledge that perhaps that was a good idea. Uh, so it, we, we acknowledge that there are things that we're not good at. And we have to find a way to accept Accept ourselves the way we are. And ultimately, this is about self confidence. And you know people who come across with great self confidence. Uh, uh, and you know people who struggle. Uh, and the people who struggle with their confidence. It's it it's it's harder to uh, to really trust uh, than them if if they're in a position of leadership. Remember, leadership is my specialty area. That's what what we tend, we focus on. But again, we think that everybody is a leader because everybody leads their own life. So, uh, so we're talking about these as being important for you, no matter where you are in the organization, uh, and uh, uh, and to be confident, to feel that you are confident and competent enough to do what you want, to be on purpose. Uh, that's intelligent. To do what you love. Um, part of, of self-perception is the, the, you may have seen it in the model, is self-actualization. You may have learned about that from Maslow. Maslow had many great things to say, one of which is, uh, is that uh, that this idea of fulfillment is available to you. Uh, of course, it's at the top of the hierarchy of needs. So if you're struggling for food and shelter, uh, fulfillment is, is not on your list. You need that. You have to get those things first. So it is about following the hierarchy of needs, getting to self-actualization, getting that sense of fulfillment. And then later on in the model, I'm going to come back to this idea uh, because Maslow didn't stop there. He said, he said, it's not really all about you ultimately. Uh, and so I'm going to, I'm going to talk about that momentarily. So 
do what you love um, because the world needs more people who do what they love, who are fulfilled and self-actualized and reach their potential. And, um, uh, and, and, and of course, uh, we, can, uh, we can do what we can have a life that we love by incorporating work aspects. Uh, or uh, if, if, if that uh, option is not available at work, if we can't make that something that we love and make that fulfilling, then we, we find fulfillment outside of work. But ultimately, it is about finding that fulfillment, being involved in what is fulfilling for us. And a tip for you here, one tip, uh, quick presentation, uh, quick tips, uh, focus on your strengths. Yeah, there's things you don't do well. Don't worry about those. Forget about those. Focus on what you do well. What is that? And do more of that. Uh, and feel good about that uh, and, and have some pride uh, that, that you do uh, that thing well. Let's go to our next slide. Uh, and David, uh, yes, for us. Are you? Can I just throw in the question here? Because sure, I saw one question. Yes, it yes, might, yes, and yes, it links absolutely. also with your strength and do the things that you love. Um, there was a question about hiring better lead, hiring leaders, and how we can measure maybe their emotional intelligence as part of a hiring process. So, yeah. is there a way we can choose the right people in the right position? And if you're not in the right position, how do you kind of use EI? to to reorient yourself or hire the right people yeah absolutely it's a great question france and when i first started uh, years ago um I, I there were I, I got invited in to speak to a lot of federal uh, hiring groups and and staffing groups and and people uh, people loved what they heard about the eqi uh but nobody wanted to uh to defend it in the case of a, of an appeal and i get that and and really you, using a psychometric like the eqi uh, it does have some challenges in using it for hiring but but i encourage people to think about using it or even the model uh, using it as a, um, in, in an exploratory way versus a predictive way because the, the best use of the EQI is in development but it can be used in recruiting and screening and, and again in an exploratory way I'm happy to, to speak with anybody uh, offline about, uh, about the details of how to do that in a way that is ethical and appropriate. Um, one of the uh, I, I kept getting asked and so I came up with 15 questions one for each of the 15 skills of this model model uh, if for, to use in an interview. Uh, and it turns out it's, it's our, our most popular blog post uh, of all blog posts over that we've done over the years. Um, because people are looking for tools. They're looking for ways of how, how, you know, how can we be better at uh, trying to hire more emotionally intelligent people into our uh, positions, particularly of leadership. Uh, and there are ways. Uh, it's a, more of an understanding of this model, understanding of how to, to create great questions. Uh, and, and there's more. Uh, but we don't really have yes. time to go into it in detail. I know you need to move into the other uh, other categories of the EI. Um, is there a way we can improve our EI, David? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so, some some people look at this model and think, you know, how how is self regard a competency? Uh, how can I improve that? Uh, and uh, and what my response to that is that there are ways that we regard ourselves that support the achievement of our goals, and there are ways we regard ourselves that uh, hinder. The achievement of our goals. So in that way, you can do, it's not grammatically correct, but you can do self-regard well, uh, or you can do self-regard poorly. It is the, those are possibilities. So what we say in, in coaching uh, is that, and, and by the way, coaches don't tell people what to do. What we coaches do is we make you more aware of the options available to you. And the more we learn about where you are currently, uh, the, and the more we understand uh, what might have to change in order for you to move forward, uh, the, 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 and the greater awareness you have of your current situation, the more options uh, you have, and then you choose. We don't choose for you, uh, we coaches, uh, but we do help you to see things differently, to get gain more awareness, to gain new perspectives and new understandings. Uh, of your current situation so that uh, so that you can um, pave your own way forward. Thanks, David. There's a few more questions, but I'll leave it um, after the few more segments that you have to present. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, great. Uh, yeah. So, uh, all right. So, so the, we're looking at the picture of the iceberg because we, we use the, the iceberg image frequently in our training. Uh, we, um, 
uh, we human beings are like the proverbial iceberg, right? There's this image, this way we, that we dress, this way that our face, facial expressions look, the um, uh, the way we do our hair or what, whatever uh, that gives a certain, communicates something. And then there's all of which is beneath the surface. Uh, and, um, uh, and that uh, uh, doesn't get really known unless we choose to show it or share it. Uh, it, it does leak out uh, when we think we're not sharing it. Um, but then again, uh, when you gain the skills to be able to share more from what's beneath your surface, you are choosing courage over comfort. Uh, and this was originally said by Abraham Maslow, made more famously, uh, made, made famous more recently by Brene Brown. But choosing courage over comfort leads to greater relationships, deeper uh, relationships of higher quality uh, with, with those people that we work with, with those people that we live with, with everybody. Uh, and so the more you let people know what's going on beneath your surface, the more you are known, the more people trust you. Uh, we don't trust what we don't know. And if you're a leader who plays their cards close to their chest and doesn't let on how what you're thinking and feeling about things, people can't trust you. You're not creating the breeding ground for trust. So that this is where this becomes so critical and important. If we go to the next slide now, we'll look at the next um, the, at the next category. Uh, and this is self-expression. So we saw self self-perception. How do you perceive yourself? Now, how do you express yourself in the world? Uh, and and this ability to express express your feelings, wants, wants, and needs is critical and important. Now, the reason that those are images of men is not a mistake. Men, what are men told? When, when we're very young, what do we men get told about emotions? Big boys don't, and I can let you finish the sentence. You know what that last part is. Big boys don't cry. That's what we learn about expressing our emotions. And so whatever we're feeling, you don't let on. To let on, to let others know what's going on inside us is a sign, is a show of weakness. Vulnerably, vulnerability, the literal definition of vulnerability is opening oneself up to harm. Who wants to do that? No one. So uh, we have to understand that, uh, that that old traditional notion of vulnerability is outdated. Opening ourselves up now, being vulnerable now means a better relationship with others. That's where we have to get to. When you, when, you, when, you, when you are open, there's no guesswork, right? You all know those people who keep their cards close to their chest and you're always guessing. And when we guess what's going on for people, we get it wrong. Because we're not mind readers. We don't know that. Uh, and, um, and so to, to be able to express yourself is to have boundaries, to say what's okay and not okay for others to do. Um, uh, and you can see the connection between some of these parts of the model. You have to have a healthy self-perception before you have healthy boundaries. Uh, and then creating the foundation for trust and great relationships. Uh, so the tip is to choose to be known. Let people know more about what's going on uh, inside you. Uh, the, there's a risk reward equation there. Uh, and uh, and the, greater the, the greater you risk, the greater the rewards. All right, let's, uh, oh, there's probably lots of questions now, Franz. Is there anything that bubbles up that you, that you, that might be relevant and appropriate there's, to ask now? There, there's so many great comments. I think it's okay, worth great. sharing. You see this, David? It's an uh, yeah. awesome, <laughs> okay. a lot of stuff happening in WooClap. And I think it triggers a lot of, of questions about uh, how to develop the EI, how do you also promote, but also um, right. how do you change the culture around e emotional emotions in the workplace? There seems to be a taboo around emotions. Yeah. Oh, wow. So many great questions. So many great questions. And uh, and and so much traditional thinking that we have to challenge, right? Uh, um, uh, the, 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 the notion that uh, that men are bad at emotional intelligence, we have to challenge it. Uh, it it's... Um, um, uh, it, it's it, men have the capacity. Uh, to, uh, they've just been socialized away from it. In fact, we as a society have been socialized away from embracing our emotions, from encouraging express expressions of emotion, uh, and various cultures do this to varying extents as well. So uh, again, uh, culture plays an important role. Uh, it's knowing what's emotionally intelligent in a particular culture, knowing and understanding how things go. I, I saw a quick comment. Uh, I, I, I didn't even see the whole question, but something about uh, people being born leaders, this notion that people are born leaders, uh, it's false. Uh, there's, there's no truth to it. Uh, now, emotional intelligence. How do we get our emotional intelligence? 
it, there is probably part nature and part nurture. There is some genetic predisposition there. Uh, and then we learn everything else. Mm -hmm. So if you are emotion, if, if, if um, emotions were taboo for you and they, they uh, you know, the expression of emotion was completely out of the picture for you, consider bringing it into the picture, consider changing. People say, but, but it's just the way I am. And I remind people that's the way you choose to be. Uh, nobody is just the way they are. It's the way they choose to be. Now it's understanding the factors and influences that led to you being the way you are. That's critical and important. And that's where coaching comes in. That's where you can get with your coach and you can talk about, um, uh, about um, uh, the, the fact that you are the way you are because you believe uh, and assume certain things to be true. And then you can challenge those and say, what if those weren't true? What is another way of, of thinking and believing? All right. There's, uh, uh, there's, there's two votes here on, on the screen because you can see how many people put, did put a heart behind one question they really liked. Yep. Uh, so I'd like to read you two here. Sure, Why great. do we tend to judge ourselves so, so hard or very hard? And the second question is how do mental illness such as anxiety or depression factor into EI? Oh, fantastic questions. Two, I love these questions. These are great questions, Franz. Uh, and so, so let's, let's start with, uh, with the one about judging ourselves harshly. Uh, so we, we, got the, we got that belief somewhere. Uh, where we set the bar for ourselves, we got that somewhere. Uh, and so where do we get it from? Is it our parents? Is it our family? Uh, I, I have that. My, my family set the bar pretty high. So, so I'm constantly, you know, unconsciously, subconsciously measuring myself against that invisible bar. Uh, and, uh, and again, you know, we, we put un unnecessary stress on ourselves by doing that. Uh, and th this, um, it's the reason why some people's uh, self, self regard scores are low on the EQI is because they, they do have really high expectations of themselves and they've not met their own expectations. So it's about, it's about being more realistic and other aspects of our model come into play like reality testing. What is realistic for us? What is an acceptable level for us? Uh, and then there was there, there was that that other question for us that oh connected to mental health. So this model are, was a, originally a model for mental health. So these are things that these are skills and tools that you will need in order to be mentally healthy. What is mentally healthy? Mentally healthy is being able to cope with and address and deal with environmental challenges. So from waking up in the morning to getting to work to whatever your boss drops on your desk to whatever your colleague brings in to talk to you about, uh, we have to have the ability to cope. Uh, and this, this is no surprise to any of you, but I actually had the guy who was responsible for tracking these stats for the federal civil service. And he told me that, uh, that uh, it was a huge, huge high number. Um, maybe it was uh, around 80% of all the people off on leave were off on um, stress leave. Uh, so that means that, that, that there's a huge high number of people. And this is not uncommon. In, in It's not just government. It's everywhere in the world where, where people are off on stress leave. This means that people don't have the skills to deal with what comes at them. Now, you can say that what comes at them is unfair or, or you can, you know, make the, the blame, uh, turn the blame to the other side. Um, but, but, you know, um, what is, what are those skills and what are those tools? And these are they, the ones that we're talking about right now. If there's a model of skills that you need to develop in order to be emotionally intelligent, this is it. Uh, in fact, uh, I like to, I like to, um, to brag about the fact that, that companies like Google, Nike, Amazon, Amazon and Microsoft with virtually unlimited resources to research and, and look at tools, they pick this one. Uh, and, um, and, and of course, this tool is widely used uh, throughout um, uh, every type and kind of organization that you can imagine all over the world. So, okay, so, so here we are at self-expression uh, and, and, uh, and men. And so we've got this socialization that says to men, don't express your emotions. And we have managers telling us in their coaching, why do I have to share my emotions with my team? And the reason, again, is to uh, offer transparency. Uh, uh, when, when, when you offer uh, people transparency, uh, they feel honored. They feel like they've been let in. They feel like, wow, my leader just shared something real with me, something honest, something authentic and genuine. Uh, and, and again, just laying that groundwork for trust and great relationships. So choose to be known. 
Let's David. go into our, yes, France. Just before you move, because sure, there's a question yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. um, what's the recipe for balancing too much sharing versus not enough? Because Yeah, great question. We're, we're getting there. Uh, we're going we're gonna to get there shortly. So hang on to that question. I'm going to answer okay. it. Um, but next, we're going to look at um, uh, at this whole area. If we could have the next slide, please. Yes. We're going to look at this. Just yep. before you start here, there's a yes. lot of questions about your deck. People are so interested in it. Yes. Oh, absolutely. We're going to share the yes. deck. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We yeah. will share it French and English. Don't worry. After yes. the event. Yes. So yeah. And we, and we want we want you to share it with everyone, yes. you know, uh, and, uh, you know, we're we're, we're so, so um, uh, committed and dedicated to getting this this information out into the world. So so let's talk about the connections that you have in your life. Harvard Longevity Study. This, um, this, they looked at Harvard grads uh, over, the, over their entire lives. Now, they were all men because they started in the 30s where there was only Harvard grads who were men. And the biggest, single biggest factor to longevity, relationships. So knowing who's in your corner, who's got your back, who's there to share your secrets with, to share your hopes and dreams with. Uh, and these, the, the men who got together frequently with, with other colleagues, and, uh, and, and had those kinds of, of great relationships with other people lived longer than the ones who did not. Uh, and uh, and of course we understand this from a commonsensical point of view, but but it's uh, it's nice to have research. Once again, when we choose courage over comfort, we're choosing to risk the possibility of a relationship getting better. So we all know how to shut down relationships, right? So that's easy. We just shut up. We stop talking. We don't say anything more. And that relationship will wither and die. Now, if that's an important relationship to you because you work with that person and you're not likely to go anywhere and they're not likely to go anywhere, then you can choose to suffer. That's a choice you have. Or you can choose to do something about it. And that really, that's a great definition of leadership, isn't it? Choosing to suffer with something versus actually stepping up and doing what's possible, what can be done. And what's possible and can be done in those relationships that you've let wither is for you to say something, right? It's to talk about the elephant in the room. That's leadership too. Le leaders bring up the elephant in the room. They're not afraid to face reality and face what's honest and what's real. Uh, and, uh, and connection happens beneath the surface. You may need to talk about the budget, but what you really want to know is how does that person actually feel about the budget? You know, and I'm not talking about the, the, the national budget. I'm, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about any piece of business that you have to discuss with your colleagues. You share what you think what you think about it what you feel about it say this is my worry this is my concern this is what i'm excited about this is what i'm so i'm so happy that we did this share all of that it will bring you closer uh, and create greater trust and and uh, uh, and a greater better working relationship with with everybody okay let's in the interest of time let's move on uh, and well, maybe we'll take some questions. France, uh, is there some questions that kind of I think there's a, a clarity stand question. Out for you? Yes, okay, a clarity question about um, when you're referring to coaching, are you referring to a specific category like psychologist mm. or what, what are you referring to? Yeah, great question. Thank you for that question. Uh, and really, um, uh, coaching, uh, as you may know, is one of the fastest growing professions that there is. And there's all kinds of, uh, of wonderful coach training. And there's a there's an international federation, the International Coaches Federation that that will accredit you and make sure that you are coaching at a particular standard. And, and so uh, in general, I'm talking about those coaches, uh, but it could be a leader who's developed coaching skills. Uh, and the great thing about coaching skills is it's respectful. It, uh, it gives people dignity uh, when you approach a situation with an employee uh, and you know what what uh, what the right way is to, out of this this particular dilemma? Offer them the opportunity to figure out figure it out first. That's that's coaching. It's like asking a good question. What's another way that you could do this? What's another way to think about this? Um, uh, and coaching begins with the idea that people are naturally creative, resourceful, and whole. So so every one of us kind of knows what we need to do. We just might not be thinking about it yet, or have the 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 right next step um, uh, 
just yet, but when we talk it over, when we bounce ideas off people, those things become clearer to us and we understand them at a greater level. So I'm talking about all kinds of coaching, the kind of informal coaching that you might do with a friend when you say, hey, would you like some coaching around that? Uh, and then you just start asking questions. You don't give advice. Giving advice is not coaching. Uh, giving advice is consulting, at which you know some of us are happy to do as well. If we have particular expertise in that area, we'll do that too. But really, it's about um, uh, offering people a way out with dignity and respect. Thank you. And there's another question, if you allow me to ask it. <laughs> sure, go ahead, Franz. Um, there seems to, uh, in the managerial training, um, there seems to be an encouragement where people need to distance themselves from the employees. Um, so how do you really establish the boundaries, David? Uh, specifically yeah. when you have to evaluate and assess performance, delegate, and then you have to encourage a coaching relationship. So how do you, how do you balance all that? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, and the answer is that, uh, that what, what you've, some of the things that you've just mentioned uh, are kind of traditional notions of how management and employees should be with each other. Uh, and, and that is, uh, once again, that's evolving and changing. With the younger generations that are coming into the workplace now, uh, they don't want that same uh, sort of distance between them and their manager. They, they want to get to know you as a person. They want to have a, a better relationship. Relationship. And there's, there's no reason why you can't. People say, oh, but what, what, ha what happens when, it, when I have to discipline them? Then discipline them. You, we, can discipline our we can discipline our friends. We simply have to say, listen, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I have this responsibility. And part of that responsibility, it means that I have to, we have to talk about uh, the, the fact that you're not meeting the standard or, or whatever it is. And we teach people how to do that in ways that are actually much more humane. It's like start out with, I'm concerned about your performance. I'm worried about you um, because this needs to happen and you're not, you, you're not there yet. And we encourage, we encourage assertive conversations far before performance management every time. Uh, and this idea about going, you know, doing, uh, for, uh, going for social events with employees, it's, it's, uh, we're, we're all adults. We can differentiate between when we can be friends and when we have to be in uh, positions of authority over, over another. Uh, and again, workplaces are becoming flatter. They, there's not the rigid hierarchy that there was in the past. And I would encourage you to challenge some of your beliefs around those outdated notions uh, of you having to maintain some sort of distance or have to, to keep people at arm's length. When you keep people at arm's length, you're, you're keeping them from trusting you as well. You're keeping them from, uh, you know, having your back when you need them to have your back. Uh, you, what you want is a much more uh, deeply connected relationship. Uh, and just think about those best leaders you ever had. I bet they had no trouble being the authority figure when they needed to be. Uh, and they did it in a way that uh, respected you and offered you your dignity as a human being. Uh, and it can be done. So out with the old, in with the do. That's my answer. Thank you, David. We can continue. All right, let's go to the next slide and take a look at, at our next uh, category of uh, EQ skills. And this is where uh, the model specifically talks about the, the, the combination of logic and emotion. Uh, and so, so what we've got here is uh, we've got uh, problem solving. Problem solving as an EQ competency uh, is, all of, is not about your technical skills. It's not about whether you have the technical skills to solve the problems you need to solve in the workplace, but it's all about whether you uh, take action right away, whether you avoid versus approaching, whether you worry versus you know, getting down to problem solving, uh, whether you struggle uh, with the problems that you have uh, versus finding the right people, talking to the right people, getting the right information and moving forward in a smooth fashion. Now, what's interesting about this is that uh, Mr. Spock from Star Trek would probably score high on our, on our social, on our problem solving, but that's because he doesn't have any emotions. So that's problematic. If you go about solving your problems with no emotion, that's a problem. Uh, so you do want to consider the people involved. You do want to consider the impact uh, on the organization. Uh, and, uh, and then another part of decision making is reality testing. This is where unconscious bias comes in. And if you've never taken the implicit association test, you might want to look that up. The Harvard implicit association test, which, which actually tests how biased you are. And when you take the test, it doesn't seem like that's what it does. And then you find out that actually you had, uh, you, 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 your, um, 
um, your perceptions of reality, we're biased and they're biased by our socialization, by our gender, they're biased by our culture, they're, they're biased by the, 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 the type of work that we've done, et cetera. And it is the best argument for diversity out there uh, is to make sure that you have uh, diverse perspectives working on any particular problem. You wanna bring in those di that diversity and that's gonna help you to, um, to mitigate against this concept of unconscious bias. So the, ch the tip here uh, is to choose to be more aware of your biases. And so the next time you're, you have a group problem solving session, uh, just you know, be upfront with your biases. Hey, I'm a, uh, an, an old white guy. That, 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 I'm biased by that. So you know, that means that I grew up in a certain era. I was influenced and impacted by certain cultural events, uh, et cetera. Uh, and and, um, uh, and my, my skin is white. That also biases me towards the world. I've never actually, I've never been uh, sort of discriminated against because of the color of my skin. So that, that means that I haven't had experiences that others are having. And, uh, and, and we, we really have to talk about those topics which are difficult to talk about, like anti-Black uh, racism and other kinds of discrimination in the workplace. We have to talk about it, even though it makes us squirm and feel uncomfortable. Leader, once again, leaders wade into what is uncomfortable uh, and they talk about it. They choose courage over comfort and, uh, and they choose to try to know better so that we can all do better. Uh, and that's critical and important. All right, so so that's that's that piece there, the decision making. Uh, let's maybe um, well, uh, France, are there some questions jumping off the the screen for you that we should probably take right now? Well, we can look at the screen, but in the meantime, there's a lot of comments about relationship between uh, an abusive, aggressive boss, a lack of trust, uh, and yes. you as an employee. So yes. how do you navigate the whole thing, and how do you raise the awareness bar of everybody, yeah. and, and yeah. specifically in a conflict situation? So I'm, I'm integrating a lot of comments here in, in one sure. sentence. Yeah, yeah, you know, we, we frequently get these kinds of questions, and uh, and this uh, this my my spouse who who now works in our company with with me as a coach and a trainer uh, in the area of emotional intelligence. Her entire career was dedicated to uh, to uh, supporting women who are, were experiencing violence in in their intimate partner relationships, and uh, she wrote a book which is used in women's shelters all over North America called When Love Hurts, uh, and she talks about the fact fact that being assertive against abuse is dangerous. Uh, and and so you know we, we we talk about developing your these skills so that you can you know um, uh, be better at uh, at coping with and dealing with and addressing the you know th this kind of treatment but you can learn about drawing boundaries, but abusive people, bullies will will uh, just uh, break through those boundaries. Um, you know that's that's why people uh, make jokes about restraining orders because it, it, people don't res uh, abusive and and bullies don't re don't respect restraining orders. They don't respect boundaries, and so it's a very difficult and challenging situation that you're in. Uh, the 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 way that we address it, uh, because um, you know that's that's not our specific uh, target area, is we talk about the creation of psychological safety using these skills. In fact, uh, Amy Edmondson, the woman who coined the term, excuse me, psychological safety, said that many managers don't have the emotional intelligence to create psychological safety. So we come at come at it from that point of view and help people to understand uh, what is uh, what is abuse and, and what is just what is bad treatment, uh, what is uh, ineffective leadership, uh, and and what is effective leadership. And so, uh, so when you're confronted by uh, by a situation like that, uh, get help really is the is the answer is you know uh, go through the EAP program um, uh, look up you know and, and understand what can be done according to the policies and guidelines that govern your workplace um, uh, to to see what can be done about that uh, and of course any HR professional will tell you to document 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 so you're you are tracking uh, all of the uh, the instances and and uh, and the, uh, the 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 types of things that that people um, have done uh, and Thanks. with dates and times and, and all, all of that and, and really get help. Is there such thing, David, as no emotional intelligence? Because like, we, yeah, we so seem it's... to perceive that there are a lot of people <laughs> having no emotional intelligence or a lack of emotional intelligence. So is there such a thing 
as no I, 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 I hear I hear it all the time, Franz, it makes me laugh. Yeah, it, I, I know exactly what they mean, right? Uh, uh, and uh, it's not possible. Uh, we all have emotional intelligence. Our emotions guide and direct our lives. So uh, so we so someone who appears to to not be very intelligent about emotions, uh, what what that looks like is that, uh, and it was right at the center of the 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 word cloud, selfish. Uh, when when we're only thinking about ourselves, we come across as aggressive to others. When we're only th- only thinking about ourselves, we don't. Uh, empathy is not on our radar screen. We're not paying attention to what's going on for others. Uh, when uh, when when we're only con- thinking about ourselves, we are an ineffective leader. Mm, thank you, David. And there's a lot of questions about resources, books. I know you've mentioned quite a few. Can you just repeat a few, and we'll ask the team. Sure. To yeah. Write absolutely. It in yeah. Yeah. We'll we'll get um, uh, we'll we'll get a, a list together for you. The one that we highly recommend in all of our courses and programs is the EQ Edge, Emotional Intelligence and Your Success. The, and the reason we we recommend it is it is about this particular model. So it's got one chapter on each of the 15 different EQ competencies. Uh, other great books mm-hmm. include Emotional Intelligence 2.0 by Travis Bradbury. It's a short little book, great stories, illustrations of, of emotional intelligence. Uh, and uh, most recently, um, my, my new favorite is uh, Susan David's book, uh, Emotional Agility, uh, with lots of great tips and, and suggestions and, and stories and examples. Thank and you. And there's more. And- yeah. We'll put a list together. And then I'm inviting people as well in, in the audience. If you know great books on emotional intelligence, you want to share it and we'll clap, please do so. Uh, we'd love to learn from you guys as well. Thank awesome. you. Excellent. Okay, so let's let's go on, and we're on, we're on to our last category of emotional intelligence skills here, uh, and this of course is stress management. And once again, I, I mentioned that that there's a lot of people off on lee on stress leave all over the world, and and really that's just the inability to cope with the pressures of work and life together, uh, and uh, and it's about developing skills, tactics, strategies, uh, and uh, and the evidence uh, for for this uh, is that you can adjust your sails to suit the wind, even in a storm. Uh, and, and so, you know, no matter what the winds, you can become a more skilled sailor. And, and that's really what, what stress management is all about. Um, uh, and this curve, uh, we use this curve a lot in our training. It's the Yerkes dodson Stress Law or the Yerkes dodson Stress Performance Curve of 1908. Uh, and it's funny to think about that it was created in 1908 because we often think that stress is a modern day phenomenon. Uh, and they even had stress back then. Uh, and what, what's interesting is they identified this part of the curve, which is too little stress. They called it underload. Uh, and, um, uh, and then they talked about this, this good stress, which we call U-stress, E-U stress. Uh, and that is in the yellow area of optimum stress. That's where we like to be. Uh, you know, we all think that we'd love to have no stress. But interestingly, uh, in situations of no stress, we get bored. Uh, so imagine, you know, you have absolutely no stress. Um, then it, it's how long can you have absolutely no stress before you start looking for something to do? And then as soon as you start looking for something to do, you're, you're creating some stress for yourself. Uh, and then when it's optimum, it's doing something that's enjoyable or fulfilling or it's what we want to be involved in or what we want to do. And then if we keep trying to do more and more and more, we get to that, uh, that fatigue part of the curve and then we can easily fall into exhaustion and then anxiety, panic anger and breakdown, uh, which we call burnout. And we don't want to get there. We want to recognize where we are on the curve and then take uh, measures to, uh, to address uh, our, uh, our situation. And quite frequently, that involves self-care. So are you getting enough exercise? Are you eating right? Are you sleeping? Uh, are you getting enough sleep? Uh, are you uh, doing things that you enjoy? Hobbies, um, uh, reading, uh, et cetera. So, so, so that's, that's the tip there. Uh, of course, it's much more complex and there are some really great uh, EQ competencies found within stress management, like flexibility. Can you flex and adapt to things that are beyond your control? Um, uh, and then there's optimism. How is your outlook on the world? And, and some people think that, that you either are optimistic or you are not optimistic. Um, uh, and uh, uh, in fact, Martin Seligman, the, the guy who's quite who's credited with, uh, uh, with being the father of positive psychology, uh, wrote a book called Learned Optimism, where he broke down optimism. Uh, 
optimism uh, and looked at what you need to improve in order to be optimistic, that there's various aspects uh, of thinking about yourself in the world that can help with that. So you can learn any, you can be better at any of these if you choose to be. Uh, and there's lots of help and support out there in order to do that. So let's just review the five tips again, uh, France, and then we'll look at all those great questions that people have until we run out of time. So uh, so the final slide, or the, the set next to last slide here is uh, are the five tips to improve EQ. So number one, um, in terms of your self-perception, focus on your strengths uh, and look at all the things you do well and, 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 and choose to look for ways to leverage those and focus on those. Uh, tip number two, and these are not these are not comprehensive, and these are these are not a long term plan or strategy. These are quick tips. Two, choose to be known. Let others know more about what's going on inside you. You know, I used to think that that when my partner asked where I wanted to go to eat, and I said, "Oh, it doesn't matter to me. Anywhere you choose." I thought I was being easygoing and flexible. I didn't realize I was not being a contributing member of that relationship. And so when I when I realized that. Now, when she, when she asks me, where do you want to go for dinner? I think, yeah, that's a good question. Where do I want to go for dinner? I take some time. I think about what that is. Uh, I, I check in with my body and then I contribute to the relationship. So choose to be known. Uh, Number three, choose courage over comfort. Yeah, you can you can stay uh, up near the surface if you want, um, uh, and uh, and have relationships that are superficial and not characterized by deep connection and affection. Uh, and aff affection has is is a is a bad word in the workplace, uh, and I think it's a great word. Affection is just communicating how you feel about someone. It do, you don't have to hug. In fact, don't hug people, please. Um, uh, particularly right now during COVID, uh, but. Uh, um, uh, but tell people how you feel about them. Tell people that you appreciate them. Reach out and share uh, with them uh, uh, how you feel about them and, and maybe how much they've impacted or, or uh, your life and maybe inspired you and, and challenged you, et cetera. Um, so, so number four uh, is uh, choose to be aware of how emotion hinders your decision making. Are you a procrastinator? Are you an avoider? Are you a worrier? And take some steps to do something about that. Um, work with a coach. Uh, you know, have that. You know, uh, take a look at what what are, what are you procrastinating about? What's that all about anyway? Uh, and and really come up with some better strategies for you so that you make better decisions and you acknowledge all the emotions that are involved in those, those decisions that you make. And finally, choose self-care. Uh, take care of the goose that lays the golden eggs. So um, uh, you, you need to stay in top physical condition. You need to stay in top mental, spiritual, emotional condition uh, so that you can be of use to others. Uh, and that, that's where the, the, the Maslow's uh, pyramid is turned upside down in the area of social responsibility. Um, Maslow said, it's not enough for you to develop yourself. Stephen Covey said, it's not enough to develop yourself using the seven habits. He wrote the eighth habit, which is all about making the world a better place, serving other people. Maslow said, unless you're involved in the self-actualization of other people, you can't get to the next level after the self-actualization part of his original pyramid, which is transcendence. And then Martin Seligman wrote authentic happiness, where you can't be authentically happy unless you're involved in the happiness of others. So much, much brighter people than me came up with these things. Um, and, and of course, it's the basis for a lot of, of wonderful and, and helpful philosophies and religions uh, uh, over time. This whole idea of, 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 you know, we develop our skills and then we, we develop the skills of others. So, all right. So that's where I wanted to end. Maybe we could have the last question up there uh, yes. or the last, the last slide there, and then we'll take questions. And really, I want to tell you just quickly about this last slide. Uh, this is a photo from where I used to live. I just in December moved over from Vancouver, or some of you will recognize this photo, uh, to uh, North Saanich on Vancouver Island. So, um, uh, so this is where I used to live, a beautiful spot, moved to another beautiful spot. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions uh, or, or talk about any 
any of this with any of you at any time offline. So, so jot down that, uh, th those numbers there. And we have, we have all kinds of resources, free resources that we make available to people to like webinars. Our next one is on toxic masculinity, which you might want to check out. Wow. Okay. Let's take those, let's take those questions now. Yes. Folks. And David, I just want to model. I just want to highlight maybe something that you just did. You see, you shared something about yourself. You did not just use a random picture in your PowerPoint. You shared something that brought us closer to who you are as a leader, as a trainer, as a speaker. So that's maybe one way that uh, leaders can start is start putting pictures about your environment, your, your, your what you do in life and not just take a random picture. So just highlight that. <laughs> it's it's one one of the things for us that I loved when COVID happened and everybody started working from home. All these news anchors, uh, all of a sudden you you were in their homes, and it was so wonderful. It was like, wow, I feel so much closer to that person who just read the news before. Now I feel like I know them a little bit, right? We yes. just you know, there that's their kitchen in the background, and well, and just those kinds of things are wonderful. It's amazing. You might see it this way and you might see it in other ways. Well, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm being seen at home and now you see boxes behind me because I'm moving soon. And then it's like, oh my gosh, they know things about me that normally they wouldn't know. <laughs> yes. Yes. And it's a frequent um, question that we get, Franz, and someone might have even asked it. How do you how do you maintain these kinds of relationships virtually? Uh, and one of the, one of the mm. things is is you you insist on cameras being on. You know, I, I just really, when people are having a meeting and people have their cameras off, it's like, why do you have your camera off? You know, we can't get together in person, but we can approximate that when you have your camera on and I can see you uh, and I can see your facial expression. I can know how engaged you are. And then there's other little tips and tricks like going around the room and getting input from everyone at the start of the meeting, just a quick little check in. And then at the end of the meeting, a quick little check out, you know, what are you taking away from this meeting? These, these kinds of quick little check in, check out, uh, and lots of opportunity for uh, for contribution during the meeting. These are ways that you can make virtual meetings much better. People complain about virtual meetings. I have great virtual meetings with everybody, uh, and well, I this, love them. This is maybe something we need to grasp on is that the coaching techniques as well, the kind of questions that will bring people more visible and more engaged in the virtual space. So yes. let's move to the questions, David. Great. I really want to make sure we address the people's questions. Can we show on the screen maybe the questions? And I have a few in my back pocket for you, David, while we're Great. seeing on the Wonderful. screen. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, if you are an employee with high work ethic and suddenly have a new manager with low <laughs> ethic, how do you use EI to interact with the struggling manager? Yeah, it seems it's, to it's, always be with because of others. It's not it's not us. It's always others. <laughs> it's 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 a great question, and you know, I I I, I there, there's there's no there's no one right answer to this, but but here's a suggestion. You know what what's uh, what's it like from their perspective? You know what? Put yourself in their shoes. Uh, what are, what are their goals? What are their dreams? What what do, what do they want for themselves in that role? Uh, and uh, and and maybe ask some some of those kinds of questions. Like what what do you really hope for our department or our our team? Um, you know, help me understand more about how you're setting those goals. Um, really get into that and and just sort of you know wonder to yourself about whether uh, whether just by virtue of your asking those questions or and maybe sharing your own goals and aspirations for that team or that department or that group and just having a you know people don't have the right conversations with the right people at the right time and if we only did more of that imagine how much better things would be. So really try to have that kind of honest um, uh, and uh, admittedly difficult conversation. Maybe get some coaching first, meet with a coach and talk about how you could uh, better address that situation and, and deal with that situation. Thank you, David. There's also a question about, um, we've heard the, the, the term uh, quite a bit, narcissistic personalities. Yes. Um, how do you deal and how do you increase EI of those people? Yeah, that's a difficult one. And, and here's, you know, I'm not a psychologist or a counselor. Uh, and so, you know, when people use words like that, that I that I'm pretty sure are in the DSM, whatever version they're on now, um, you know, that that diagnostic manual for psychologists, um, you know, I, I, I can only speak from my expertise and my knowledge. And, uh, and, and so, you know, if and I know that people are generally doing their own armchair psychologist diagnosis when they use the word narcissist, but really, it's, uh, 
it's helping people to understand more about their impact. Uh, and really, that's what we teach people to how to do uh, to to uh, share the the fact that that the behavior that the person had has had a particular impact on them. And that's really learning more about being in touch with your own emotions and being able to speak about your emotions. So to say to someone, um, I'm, I am feeling, you know, so left out here because you've gone ahead and made all these plans without me. I don't see myself in there. Uh, and I just, you know, it, it just, it takes the wind out of my sails. I, I don't feel as motivated or inspired to work. And I, I'm pretty sure that's not your intention is to cause us to feel demotivated, but that I'm sharing with you now that that's the impact. And in light of that information, some people actually change. Some people don't. And, you know, we, we, we don't have control over whether people change or not. That's up to them. But we need them to have all the information. You need to go home at the end of the day and say, hey, I did everything I can do. I uh, communicated everything and I did everything I think I can do. And now the rest, I just have to find a way to accept or leave it's another option. Um, thank you, David. Um, if we can ask the team as well to share again the screen while I'm reading maybe one that really triggered my attention mm -hmm. is, um, are women better leaders than men? Yeah, great question. And there's lots of studies out there about this. And, uh, and, and there's, a, there's several studies that I recent studies that I read that where where employees actually prefer women. Uh, and, um, but but if you think about that, you know, um, uh, you, you think that, again, you have to go back to our, our gender socialization. And what you and I know, is there are women who have adapted their styles to fit into their culture, the workplace culture where they are. And so there are, are a there are women who can be just as authoritarian or just as autocratic, etc. Um, uh, and, and however, all leadership is moving towards a participative, inclusive, collaborative workplace where people are supportive of each other and and developing great relationships. So, so d despite uh, whether it's a woman or a man, we're moving towards that more. Um, uh, that that more uh, partnership relationship where leaders partner with their employees to get work done. So mm -hmm. so really that that's where we need to shift our focus from the dominance model to the partnership model, uh, and less about whether it, it's it's a it's a woman or a man. And understand that our societies have kind of contributed to the way that that women and men are with each other, and to the extent with which they believe emotional intelligence to be important because that's one part, and whether they've developed skills in that area. Thank you, David, which leads to maybe that important question. Um, how do you give managers feedback that they might need kind of an EI assessment or an EQI test without yeah. offending them? So how do you address the whole emotional intelligence at work, bring people to increase their awareness? How, so how would you address yeah. this? Yeah, so, so let me just say, you can't guarantee that you won't offend them. Uh, what you can do is you can increase the likelihood that you won't offend them by focus by being as objective as possible. So you, you're, you're talking about specific behaviors, specific circumstances, specific uh, emotional responses to said behaviors, uh, uh, and you're being as objective as possible, there's no guarantee that that person won't be offended. Uh, and you can suggest that that actually, you know, there's uh, there's lots of great uh, resources out there to help people to improve, to become more aware of their impact on others, more aware of their own emotions, and and uh, and better able to communicate and develop relationships with others. So, so why not leverage that and take advantage of those resources? Mm, thank you, David. And maybe in addition to what you're saying, I know that within government, we have those 360s feedback I know there's also in the private sector. So how do you use this information from the 360 in order to leverage that awareness and maybe improve EI uh, with maybe another tool that yes. would measure EQIs or DEI? So uh, what would you be the flow that you would recommend? Yeah, yeah. So, so a, a typical approach for us is that uh, that we frequently start with the self-report assessment. That's the EQI, the emotional quotient inventory. You you respond to a series of statements, and then it, you get a detailed report, and we review that. Um, uh, you review that with your coach uh, to understand more about where you are currently. While, while that's going on, for more senior leaders, uh, then we start the 360 process or the multi-rater process, where we ask others to rate you. Uh, um, on the exact same scale. So they're, they're answering the exact same questions about you that you answered about yourself. Uh, and then we look at all that data together. And
And sometimes, excuse me, when a senior leader sees the impact that they're having on others, they make dramatic changes. Uh, I've seen people say, this is not, they say to themselves, this is not acceptable for me. I do not want to be that person who's impacted people in that way. And they change. And then with coaching and, and support to make that change, they, they make dramatic turnarounds. Thank you, David. There's only a few minutes left, and I feel that we can continue this conversation. Um, you've used Absolutely. quite a bit. You've used the word coaching quite a lot. Um, so, coaching as a tool for people to raise their awareness, improve their level of awareness about their 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 competency, emotional intelligence, and etc. Um, yeah. Any last word? Any other recommendations you would like to leave participants with? Well, it's kind of like a it's kind of like a a, a priority list of of impacts to to improve your EQ. Coaching is at the top, no no question. Uh, if coaching is for some reason not available to you through your workplace or personally, um, it, it, and it's by the way, it's an investment in yourself. Uh, then then you're looking at books, you're looking at training courses, you're looking at uh, websites and and other resources. And and again, I'll I'll uh, put together a, a resources list uh, to mm -hmm. to share with all those of you who've registered for the webinar today. Thank you, David. And I really love the fact that you can also measure it through a self-assessment, your level of yes. emotional intelligence, because you can measure with time yes. how you also improve your emotional intelligence. Yes. And by the way, uh, France, it's an inventory. It's not a test. So okay. I know we, we well, I, not, not that you said that word. I just, I'm just highlighting the, the idea that we're, we're taking stock. We're, we're trying to figure out, you know, where are we with respect to uh, our level of functioning with respect to these skills that are so critical and important to leadership, leading one's own life. Uh, and, uh, and I love that part of my job. You know, we help people to be more effective at work and it ultimately ends up being, being that they are more effective outside side of work with their families and in their communities and uh, et cetera. Thank you, David. So um, I'd like to thank you again for being with us today, sharing your knowledge, your expertise, and your passion and your mission for, to increase the level of uh, emotional intelligence in, in the world. Um, I would also like to thank participants. It was an amazing participation today. I just felt that people were connected. They had a lot to share, and it's just the beginning of all this. Um, I'd like to also invite participants. There's a coaching summit. There's still next week happening. There's going to be a lot of events happening, and you can see it, this on a GC Collab page, our GC Collab coaching page. You can see all the information there, what's happening ahead. And the school has more events to offer you and encourage you to visit their website. Um, so you'll see that on June 3rd, there will be part of the leadership series. We're hosting a session on the leadership with the heart. What an amazing follow up to this session, to today's session with David. So the title is Leadership with Heart, Being a More Compassionate Leader. We invite you to learn more and register on the CSBS, Canada School Public Service website. And don't forget to leave us with your feedback. I, we encourage you to complete the electronic evaluation that you will receive in the upcoming days. So again, David, thank you so much. Um, it's just the beginning of, of just the future actions within within the public service on, well, we're just continuing your amazing work that you started. What, what, what year again? 1998, I've heard. 1998, <laughs> yep. Yeah. So thank you again. And thank you, everyone. Have a nice weekend, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for being here. Bye for now.